Tonight is the last night of this particular study that we've had for the last 13 weeks. And we have been studying out of this book, The Seed Principle by Aubrey Johnson. If anybody wants my copy, you can, you can grab it after class. If you'd like to read through the whole book on your own. Sowing the Life of Your Dreams. We have been taking the parable of the sower from Mark chapter 4 and making practical application from it. Because the principles that apply to us becoming strong Christians and being successful in our Christian life, those same principles apply in our non-religious life, in the life that we live and work and the goals that we set for ourselves and so forth. So that's kind of been where we're, we're going. And Jesus has used these three images from the uh, parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4, to present... Uh, the obstacles that we have in life. Now, Jesus presents it as obstacles to our spiritual life, but they're the same obstacles that we have in our non-spiritual life, our secular side of life. And that is the hard path, which is a, a dismissive attitude that doesn't take, doesn't take our goals seriously. It doesn't take life seriously. Um, you remember in the parable... Um, this seed is sown on the road itself and makes it easy for the birds to come by and, and scoop up the seed. So if we don't take ourselves seriously, then we're not going to be successful in life. If we don't have goals, if we don't have objectives, if we don't have motivation, we've been talking about this the whole 13 weeks. If we don't have any of that, we're not going to be successful. And we've got nobody to blame but ourselves. Second is the hidden rocks. Those are... Uh, those are hindrances, that, obstacles that we have in our path. A lot of those obstacles we put in our own path. Procrastination is an obstacle to success in life, for example. So limiting beliefs, problems that we have that we have to get over, we have to push through, we have to pray for strength to correct those areas in our lives. And number three are the hurtful thorns. And that is competing interests in our lives that distract us. Some of those distractions are sinful distractions. Some of them aren't sinful. But if they distract us from our main goal in life, then we need to get rid of them. When I'm preparing a lesson, it wouldn't surprise you to hear, and, and those of you that have prepared lessons before know what I'm talking about, you learn a whole lot more than what you can put into a sermon. If I put into a sermon everything I learn, then the sermon would be two hours long. So there's a lot of distractions that get in the way that we just have to leave them aside. And that applies to our lives as well as to our faith. So let's talk about faith, and let's talk about focus, and let's talk about follow-through, because we're, we're wrapping up this discussion, sowing seeds for life or success. Let's begin with faith. Somebody give me the definition of faith. Somebody quote Hebrews 11 and verse 1. And quote it loud enough for everybody else to hear you. King James Version is fine. That's what I memorized. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is substance this Bible is substance. Why? Because I can hold on to it. The Hebrew writer says faith is something you can hold on to as if it was a tangible object. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. You don't see it, but you hold on to it as if it was real. And it's the evidence of things not visible. So, how can faith help us overcome obstacles in life? That's the question that you've got to answer. And I'll give you two minutes to think about it. Floor is open for discussion. How does faith help you overcome obstacles? Knowing that God is going to be there for us. Good. What else? You're not alone. Good. What else? Perseverance. What's the relationship between faith and perseverance?
Okay, you feel like there's something worthwhile that you're working for and you believe that you're going to reach it and so you persevere. Very good. Anybody else? What? Peace? Okay, so faith and peace are related as well. It gives, if you have faith in God, it gives you a sense of peace, right? In fact, faith that God will help, point number one. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Turn over there and somebody read it for us out loud. James 4, verses 1 through 3. Go ahead. Okay, so James says you ask but do not have because of what? You don't believe. Now we have to be careful that we're not constantly asking to spend it on our own selves. So we've got to take selfishness out of the picture. But James says you don't have because you don't ask. Now, to how many of us does that statement apply? If we look back on our lives, do we find ourselves lacking because we weren't asking. And then the second point up there, uh, relative to faith, God wants us to have an abundant life. Turn over to John chapter 10 and verse 10. Rachel? So we don't have faith in ourselves and so we're afraid to push ourselves because we're afraid of failure. So we create a little box and we're comfortable in this box. We don't want to get outside of the box because we don't have faith in ourselves. And we don't have faith in ourselves because we also don't have faith in God. Right? If we've got faith in God, we're going to have faith in ourselves because we're going to recognize that God made us to be successful. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, the Holy Spirit has distributed gifts as He will. And so we've got talents, abilities, skills, whatever word you want to use, that God has given to us so that we can fit into our little niche in His great big world, and He wants us to be successful. But there are certain parts of the recipe that we've got to put into place in order to be successful. Romans 10 and verse 10. Somebody read that. John 10, verse 10. Well, you could read Romans 10, 10, but we're really on John 10, verse 10. All right, so notice that Jesus says, and this is in the context where first, Jesus says, first of all, I am the good shepherd, and secondly, he says, I am the door to the sheep. So in the context of Jesus being our shepherd and our leader, He says, I came to give you an abundant life. So Jesus wants us to be successful. He's designed us to be successful if we'll tap into that potential that He has put into our hearts. So with a little amount of faith, Matthew 17 and verse 7, somebody paraphrase Matthew 17 and verse 7. What does Jesus say about a little faith? If it's as small as a mustard seed, you'll be able to do what? Yeah. Remove a tree. There's two versions. Remove a tree or remove a mountain. Either one be cast into the sea. So with a little amount of faith and a lot of patience. Somebody read Galatians 6 and verse 9. 
Who was it that said endurance? Anna said endurance earlier, faith and endurance. Okay, perseverance. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Somebody read that one. Let's not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. So we've got to persevere if we want to be successful. Trusting, there's the faith, that God is going to bring the reward at the end, or when He realizes, or He when He knows it's time. All right. You define success. What is success in Vicky's world? <laughs> I'm getting up in the morning. I guess at a certain age that becomes a level of success. And look at all the people you've served over the years. And it's because God created us all differently. That's why we have to define success in our own terms. Not God defines success in spiritual terms. We're talking about outside of spiritual terms here. Okay, and then our dreams will really can come true. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. You should have Ephesians 3 and verse 20 highlighted in your Bibles. Somebody read that verse for us. I don't make lists of favorites, but if I were to make lists of favorite verses, Ephesians 3 and verse 20 would be one of them. Somebody read Ephesians 3.20. Okay, Paul is giving a doxology, a word of praise to God, and he says God is able to do, notice, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think. Through the power that works in us. So God, again, has designed us to fit in a little niche in His very big world, and He wants us to be successful in, in that little niche He's put us in. And we've been talking about it for the last 12 weeks. To achieve worthy aims, we must deeply, thoroughly, and passionately believe. Both in God and in the fact that God has designed us to tap into what He has created in each of us to be successful. Bryce Young is quarterback for Alabama, and he made the comment, as a player, we always have faith and confidence in the coaching staff. So for us, I don't think we ever really blinked or wavered. I think that was, I think that was coming out of the game versus Auburn. But notice he says, we've got confidence in the coaching staff. So if the coaches on the sidelines calls a particular play, Bryce Young is saying, I follow that play because that's the play the coach has called. If we have that kind of confidence in God, then we're going to say, well, God called the plays here, and if I put these plays into practice in my life, I'm going to be successful. That's what we're talking about. She was dreaming. Yeah. I don't know what she's dreaming about. I don't know the woman. She, I, I got her off of Google. I don't think that's a weird thing. Okay, she's dreaming. All right, let's talk about follow-through now. Let's talk about endurance, perseverance. A professor in college called it stick to I don't know if that's a word. But it carries the right idea, right? Endurance. Self-assurance is born of hard work. Just keep doing the right thing. Has it been discouraging the last 20 months in church? People coming and going. We get up back up to 120 when we should be up to 150, and then we drop back down to 110. But you know what we got to do? Keep doing the right thing. Because that's what the Bible says. 
You just keep doing the right thing. Right, Geneva? Just keep doing the right thing. That's endurance. That's perseverance. Again, to quote Bryce Young, who won the Heisman Trophy this year, confidence comes from what you do before the game. Now he's talking about training. We get our training and then we go to work and we have confidence in our abilities to perform. So worship, Bible study, fills us up spiritually so then we've got the energy to go put into our lives during the week. And if you have a daily Bible reading program, if you have a daily prayer schedule, then you're constantly recharging your batteries. Hopefully worship on Sunday and Wednesday night when we get together as the whole church family, hopefully that charges the batteries way up here. But then when you go to school or you go to work, the battery charge kind of comes down, but you spend time in prayer and Bible study and meditation and so forth, and you kind of fill your battery back up. But you keep going. There was this t-shirt that a woman was wearing at a marathon. She said, I'm not a completer. I'm, I'm a completer. I'm not a competer. She wasn't in the marathon to compete, except against herself. She just wanted to finish. It's endurance. Any thoughts, comments, questions? From one perspective, this, well, if God is using this life to form us into the image of His Son, then this life is training. It's to teach us, to train us to put God first, love Him supremely, and serve our fellow man sacrificially, right? Two greatest commandments, Matthew chapter 22. So, with time, this is endurance. With time, children grow up. And you're teaching them both spiritual things and non-spiritual things, but you're teaching them as they're growing up. And 18 years later, then they leave home and with prayer and um, with training and with them internalizing what you've done, then they continue on doing that same thing. Landscapes change. Runners medal. Churches blossom with endurance. Can the Swartz Creek Church of Christ be stronger and better after going through the 20 months of the pandemic? We can be. If we continue doing what we're supposed to be doing, serving people, teaching them the Word, worshiping, everything that the Bible tells us we need to be doing. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Somebody read Hebrews 12 1 for us. All right, and I should have read, read verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. So we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, the ones he's mentioned back in chapter 11. And so we need to run with patience. You know, throwing off the sin and the weight that's holding us back. And run with patience the race that's set before us. That's endurance. What did Jesus say to do with your hand if it causes you to sin? Cut it off. What about your foot if it causes you to sin? What about your eye if it causes you to sin? In other words, if there are weights that are holding you back, you've got to get rid of them. And if that's true in our spiritual life, it's also true in our intellectual life, our academic life, our work life. If there are things that are holding us back, keeping us from being successful, we need to get rid of them. Get rid of the dead weight. Oops, go back. What might be waiting for me if I hang in just a little longer? I mean, what, what are we going to have if we don't give up? We don't know, do we? It depends on what the context is. We're going to reach our goal. We're going to get what is available if we don't give up. 
And so Philippians 3 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul says that we continue moving forward, press on for the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So let's talk about focus now. We've talked about faith. Let's talk about focus. Being attentive. We have to balance our focus in life in these three broad areas. We're going to talk about them. Our relationships, our goals, and our values. So first of all, what relationship comes first in life? God. God must come first. Now, a big reason why people aren't successful in life is because they just don't have God first in their lives. God needs to come first. He's the only one that deserves first place in our hearts. And as I have up there, unthankfulness or ingratitude is the seed out of which so much else grows. Jealousy, envy, pride, all of that grows out of a lack of gratitude towards God. Having God at the center of our lives. So God, relationship with God comes first. Relationship with our spouse, for those of us who are married, spouse got to come second. A lot of marriages are hurt because children are put second. You don't put kids second. When they're two years old and under, you've got to give them a lot of time and attention. This is not a class on parenting, but kids go through the terrible twos because they're learning, or they ought to be learning, that they're not first in mom and daddy's life anymore. They were when they couldn't clean themselves when they pottied and they couldn't feed themselves. And they were the center of mom and dad's life up until two years old, but two years old... They got to go back second place. Husband or wife's got to go back to first place at that point. And, but then number three, children, for those who have children, deserve our highest level of attention. And the greatest stability that children feel in a home is if mama and daddy have a good relationship. Everything else in the world could go to pot. But if the relationship between mom and daddy is solid, the kids are going to be okay. So we have to focus on our relationships. But we've got to do this balancing act. Because all of us have got competing interests in our lives. Right? We've got competing interests. So here are some suggestions that Aubrey Johnson offers for people to, to keep your sanity. In fact, somebody else just recently suggested uh, giving, setting aside money every week all through the year so that when December comes and we're asking for contributions for the college students and we're asking for contributions for the kids for the food pantry and so forth, then you've already got all the money saved up. Well, we can do that at home. How many of you have jars at home where you throw your spare change? We could do that at home. Now, I don't like it that if you take all your change to the, the bank, then they're going to charge you money for them to count it. Eh, you don't have to do that. You give me a quarter roll, and I'll put the quarters in there, and then you weigh it, and you'll know whether or not I'm not being honest. And don't take 15% of my quarters. Pfft. Number two, you can visit the nursing home or visit the elderly or you can call. That's getting us outside of ourselves. I'm speaking in broad general terms here, but probably most of us spend too much time thinking about ourselves. I think that's part of the human condition. So if we spend a little time visiting or calling, spending holidays with others, I had a picture that just popped up on my device. I've got too many. But this 
picture popped up of a Thanksgiving that our family tried to have with the food pantry people down in Kentucky when we were down there. And so we had, I think, 15 people in the, that came to our food pantry at the church down there that, that said they would come to a Thanksgiving that Rachel and I were putting on there at the church building. So Rachel prepared for 19 people, 15 of them and four of us. One person showed up. A little old lady about that tall who didn't do, eat anything but crackers and drink orange juice. We had a lot of leftovers. But it's still good to do. It's still good to think about others. Adopt an elderly friend, go to a concert. That's, that's to ease up the stress in your life. It's for a distraction. I watch football because it's a distraction. Greet visitors. I'll tell you what, those of you who see a visitor and then greet them, that's the front line in evangelism. They might, they, they might not be particularly impressed by the preacher, but they'll be impressed by friendly people. So if you see somebody you don't recognize, introduce yourself. If they say, oh, I've been a member here for 20 years, you say, that's okay, I didn't know you. Yeah, I sit on the other side of the building. That's why I don't know you. Great visitors. Have friends over for dessert Sunday night after services. I like white chocolate macadamia nut cookies. Number eight, start email list. You can do that for free. And you can keep your family. If you got all of us have got family lives in a different state. You can keep family up to date on what's going on with you. I know it's a little impersonal, but at least you're communicating. Send out an email. Uh, MailChimp. Doesn't cost anything. Up to 500 people. If you've got more than 500 friends, then you need to pay for it. Okay, number nine, help pay others' way. That's pretty cool, isn't it? We have, we've, we've got people here that write, Jared, they'll come up to you and say, if you've got a young person that wants to go to Horizons and they can't pay, then I'll pay. That's a great thing to do. Pay somebody else's way. Uh, babysit. We've got a lot of uh, young uh, parents that could stand to have somebody babysit the kids every once in a while. Volunteer, pay, babysit them. All right, let's talk about goals. Worthy goals are pupil-oriented. Worthy goals are goals that help me be a better person towards other people. And as we try different things, experience shows us how much we can do. And if we find out that, that things start falling through the cracks then that tells us we got too many irons in the fire, right? And that means that we're losing focus. So we need to start taking some irons out of the fire so that we've got energy and time to focus on what's most important. And we may have to reprioritize our lives in order to reach the goals that we want. And then values. I said we we're going to talk about relationships and goals and values. Values. Somebody give me a definition of values. I've been talking too much. My voice is dry. Give me a definition of values. Okay, you're giving me examples. Honesty and integrity. What's a definition of values? Standards. Now we're using synonyms, so we're getting closer to a definition. What? Ethics. Something that's worth something. Something that's important to you. All right? Yeah, something that's important. We're using that word important, right? Uh, ethics is a part of that, right? It, Gabe? The moral code that you live by, which is what is important to you, right, from an ethical standpoint. Now, we could also have values that are not ethical-oriented values, sure. Values are who you are, right, on the inside. Aubrey Johnson wrote that values are the storm wall of your soul. That is, there are certain things that we will not do because it violates our values, And so it, it, it helps us stay true to who we are. 
not just spiritually and ethically, but in every area of life. If we value something, we put our, we put our money where our mouth is, right? We've got that, for, uh, that saying in America. And to maintain our values, we need social reinforcement, right? Doesn't it help to live by our values if we're around people who share the same values? Well, that's part of the purpose of the church, right? Social structure of the church is to help encourage us to live right. Challenge one another to love and good works, Hebrews 10 and verse 24. Challenge one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. So the command not to ignore worship service is in the context of strengthening each other's value system. That's our obligation as Christians is to challenge each other to love and good works. Strengthen each other and our value system. So choosing the right spouse, choosing the right friends, even choosing the right, right, right work environment. Downplaying susceptibility to... to Cultural influence is just being dishonest. I consider myself pretty strong spiritually, but I, sometimes I still hold back in saying things because I ask myself, how is this going to appear? Or how is this going to sound? When you do that, then you're recognizing that the culture has pressure on you. And that's why it's important for us to surround ourselves as much as possible with people, Christians, who share the same values. Because it strengthens our ability to live an abundant life. So here's three virtues for successful living. This is just broad love. What's the topic of my series of sermons next year on the first Sunday of the month? Who remembers? The art of loving, you'd expect the preacher's wife to get it right. The art of loving, we're going to take 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, and we're going to unpack it all year long. You're going to, you're going to get tired of hearing me talk about love. Up, conviction, that goes back to what our core values are. Are we convicted in our core values, and are we willing to live by them? and then courage. The courage to see it through. The courage to see it through to the end. Look over Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 is Matthew's account of Mark chapter 4. It's his parallel. But notice what Jesus says in verse 9. Somebody read verse 9 for us when you get to it. <laughs> the one who has ears better listen. In fact, my guess is that's a third person uh, imperative in that text, and that's why Ashton's translation says, let him hear, which the net version carries that idea. He needs to listen. So we've got to pay attention. Are we paying attention to the world around us? Are we paying attention to how people respond to us? Are we paying attention to our, the effect that our words and behavior are having on other people? Do you know people who aren't aware of what's going on around them? They don't recognize the impact that their behavior or words are having on other people? They are being successful, but probably not in the way that they would like to be. So we need to be aware. We miss a lot of opportunity not being attentive. So we need to regularly look at ourselves from the perspective of other people. How do they see us? How do they hear us? What do they think of us based on my reaction to them? Because they're reacting to me based on their view of me. So what message am I sending them? What, what am I communicating to them in my words and my behavior, my values? 
So here are the principles that we have been discussing over these last 13 weeks. And the light shining on that where I can't read it. So here's a summary of the class. First of all, decide what you want. If we're talking about success, Vicki says, what is success? If you can't define success for yourself, then probably means you're not going to be successful. How can you hit the target when you don't know what you're aiming at? So decide what you want out of life. Number two, accept responsibility for your life. All of us in this class are old enough to accept responsibility for ourselves. A two-year-old can't help what comes out of their rear end. But 20-year-olds can accept responsibility for what comes out of our mouths or what comes out of our lives. We are responsible for it. There's no, there's no blaming anybody else. You can't blame mom and dad, not at this age. Where, wherever you are right now, it's by, because of the choices you've been making. Because we're responsible for ourselves. And we need to accept responsibility for ourselves. And if we want to do better, we need to accept responsibility for that. Number three, grow inwardly. Because outward success is going to be a result of the inward decisions that we make. Who we are. What guides us. Number four, finish what you start. We talked about that. Number five, live thoughtfully. Six, put forth sufficient effort. Number seven, focus on what matters. Number eight, pursue dreams wholeheartedly. Because you honor God when you live the way God designed you to live. Thoughts or comments? Next week, in this class, now see, I try to have a, a class from a New Testament book and a class from the Old Testament book and a class that's practical, like this class has been, and a class that's almost purely intellectual. Well, guess what? This next class is almost purely intellectual. We're going to talk about the, the revealing of the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about what happens when this world ends. These are words we're going to be dealing with. Premillennialism, Battle of Armageddon, Mark of the Beast, 666, Kingdom of God, Antichrist, the Rapture. That's what we're going to start talking about next Wednesday night. At the end of this class, we've always suggested a seed that we need to plant. A seed we need to work at growing this week. So we're going to talk about bravery. We're going to pray to be brave, to be courageous. The zipline and Frankenmuth has got five ropes courses. And you pay for two hours, and you go through as many of the courses you can but you have to go in consecutive order. Start at course one, two, three, four. You can skip one of them, number two or number three, but anyway, you go as fast as you can through the courses in two hours. I don't remember what course it was I was on, but it was at the very end of the course, and I'm 35, 40 feet up in the air, standing on a wooden platform. I'm on a belay, so if I fall, I'm gonna be safe. But to get down, to get down, you have to step off of the platform. Could you do it, Llewellyn? You're afraid of heights? And here's a, here's a kicker. The, the pulleys, not James and Patricia, the other pulleys, it lets you drop about three feet before it catches on. Now, it doesn't take long for me to drop three feet. But three feet, you're dropping down, and then the pulley slow, kicks in and it slowly lets you down. 
Well, the Romanians, Josh, the Romanians would say you have to take your heart into your teeth <laughs> to have the courage to step off that platform. Sometimes we just got to take our heart in our teeth and be, be brave and see where God will lead us. So we're going to pray to be brave and we're going to pray to uproot timidity. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, some scholars suggest that this indicates that Timothy was maybe an introvert or was in some other way a, a hesitant kind of person, timid. Paul says God didn't give us a spirit of fear or timidity, depending on your translation, but of power and love and self-control. When somebody in the military runs towards the battle or a fireman runs into a burning building, they're able to do that because they've gone through training. The training kicks in and they know that's what I've got to do. That's what I'm trained to do. I'm trained to go towards the danger. Maybe at the same time they have to say, let me put that fear behind me. We got to have the same attitude sometimes. To be courageous and to live a life of faith in order to bring honor to our Savior. So let's conclude with a prayer and class will be finished. Our great God and Father in heaven, we are thankful for life. We're thankful, Father, that you have created us in your image. We're thankful, Father, for the unique way that you have created each one of us and for the abilities that we have to bring glory and honor to you and to your cause. Help us, Father, to be brave. Help us to put our faith in Christ and have the courage to live the way that he would call us to live. Help us, Father, to, to control our fear, to put our fear behind us, to be willing to step out on faith, as Peter did on the water, knowing that throughout all the storms of life, you will be with us and you will see us through to the end because we know, Father, that the ultimate goal of life is to bring honor to Christ who gave his life for us on the cross so that we could be with you in heaven. Keep us in your care, Father, as we leave here tonight and help us to honor you in all that we say and do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed.